Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It worked like on the first try. God, I'm trying to like stir my up chunks of ice over here. Sorry, guys. How dare you? Mm, but that's so good. Oh, yeah. There's a new New Orleans style cold foam. Nola. No, New Orleans style cold brew. Cold brew. At the coffee shop and oh my gosh. I love sweet cream yeah. cold foam on anything and when it's on that, it's just like. So if you're local, mm -hmm. you should come to Nicholsville. Yes. Get Jason to make you the New Orleans style cold brew. Cold brew with cold foam and on And then it. add the cold foam, yeah. Oh. And just ask for what Kelsey gets, really. Yeah. She's a little. The Kelsey drink. Yeah, she's not because everybody else gets a drink named after them. I don't have a drink named after me. You don't? Yet? Now I'm mad. How? <sighs> I don't know. How do you not? I don't think I have a drink that's like your favorite. Yeah. Your go-to. You drink everything. I drink. I drink everything. Yes. Are we starting the podcast yet? <laughs> have we? Hey guys, this is Witches, Magic, Murder, and Mystery, and we love beverages. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Megan. I'm Kara. We are here with another story for you a today. Full story. Uh, this is also murder. Um, to follow up Megan's murder last week. Yeah. 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 That was a little too happy. Yeah. Uh, murder. Sorry. Murder, y'all. <laughs> we need new shirt. New murder, shirt. y'all. Murder. Oh, probably shouldn't put that on the show. No, let's not. No. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> okay. This is a woman murderer. Ooh. Ooh. My brother Josh thinks that we should do more of these, so I try to slip them in every now and then. That's a good point, Josh. You have you have a point. Thanks, Joshua. We are an equal opportunity yes. podcast. Yes. <laughs> we cover horrible people of all, all kinds. kinds. <laughs> okay. So this is Sharon Elizabeth Hall. Uh, she was born November 30th, 1939 in Independence, Missouri. She was a junior in high school when her parents decided to move the family to Washington, but then they quickly moved back. So by the time she was 15, they returned to Missouri. Um, and she attended William Chrisman High School. Uh, when she was 16, she met 22-year-old college student James Kinney at a church function in the summer of 1956. What is 22-year-old Kinney doing at a high school church function is my question. Youth pastor. Mm -hmm. I got some stories. Problematic. Yep. Uh -huh. So then the couple started dating regularly until he decided he was going to return to Brigham Young University in the fall. Uh, so she had reportedly been interested in finding a partner with like money and like things that he was like big, big things he was going to do in his life. So she was like, mm, I need to keep him around. He had goals. He He's had a man. goals. So she wrote a How letter. She was sixteen. Yeah, it's really impressive when you're sixteen. It is for a guy to have any ambition. Period. Period. Well, this is so very true. He has thoughts. He has his own money. Uh, so she decided to write a letter to him while he was in school, informing him that she's pregnant and it's his. So he decided to leave school and he returned to Missouri, where he decided to marry her on October eighteenth of fifty six. Uh, the marriage license identified 16-year-old Sharon as being 18 and said that she was a widow. Uh, she refused to address that, and she told people at the time that she had been married when she lived in Washington to a man who later died in a car accident. She was 15 when she lived in Washington. Yeah, what is so happening? How were you married? What are, where, what are your parents doing? I was about to ask that. What are where your parents Where are doing? your parents? Yeah. What happened to you? Yes. Then they decided to have a second, more formal wedding the next year at Salt Lake Temple after she had completed the process of converting to Mormonism. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. So after the wedding, uh, they returned to Provo, Utah, where he, uh, he had been attending college. But at the end of the fall semester, um, he put his studies on hold because they decided to take jobs. And she started baby t babysitting and tending to shops, like cleaning shops and stuff. And he was an electrical engineer at um, some aviation place. So she claimed to have miscarried the child that she told him she was going to have. And that was his. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, she got pregnant again pretty soon after that. So the fall of 57, she gave birth to a girl and they named her Dana. She loved to spend money and uh, just loved like fancy things. 
Me too. But he really didn't have the funds for it. Like he, I mean, she was babysitting as a job, and you know, Dana or no, the Sharon. Dana's a baby. I know. That was time. Oh yeah, yeah. I didn't know where we were. Yeah, no, yep. Yeah, we're still early gotcha. in the in the relationship here. Mm. Mm, yeah. So at the time they were renting a home next to his parents, um, and then they decided to build a house. It was just like a little ranch. He worked a night shift at the aviation place, and so she decided she was going to shop during the day and then uh, build her evenings with other men <laughs> while he was working. This reminds me of the case I did with the girl who worked at the car dealership. Oh, yeah. And would party at night. Yes. And murdered her husband. Yeah. Yeah. That was a female killer. It was. Um, Josh. Josh. Jeez. Come on, Joshua. So by the time the couple had a second child who was named Troy, she was carrying on regular affairs and was mainly seeing a friend from her high school, John Boldus. Or Boldus? Boldus? Boldy? Boldus? Boldus? Mm -hmm. Z-S. Why would you put Z-S together at the end of the word? Oh, come on. Boldest. Z -s -z. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So James, her husband, was trying to decide if he wanted to give, get a divorce. He was just like, she's just spending so much money. We're not getting along. And also, he had suspected that she was seeing other people. So he talked to his parents about the possibility of divorce uh, in March of 1960. And... Um, he was like, look, Sharon and I have kind of agreed on this. Um, he was, I'm just going to let her keep the house. I'm going to let her keep our daughter and I'm going to give her a thousand dollars. But his parents were devout Mormons and they were like, nah, dude, you got to stay. You can't, you got to make this work. So, um, she also wanted out, um, uh, because she had was just like, yeah, a thousand dollars. I'll take it. I'll keep the house. That sounds great. Like I get to do whatever I want and you continue to pay for all this stuff. Fine. Um, but then according to John bold, bold as, uh, <laughs> she had once offered him a thousand dollars to kill her husband and find someone who, or find someone who would. Uh -huh. And he was just like, well, maybe she's joking. Like listen, dollars. That's not a joke ever. If your friend ever says like, ha ha, I'll give you money to kill my husband. Why do you hang out with that person? Also, if you think that's even possibly a joke, he, he's was, still not okay. he was about to give her a thousand dollars to get a divorce, and she was going to turn around and give a thousand dollars to somebody to kill him. I'm also like to his parents. Listen, if you are staying in an unhappy marriage because you think that's what God wants you to do, mm. what on earth? Yeah, like what is your God like? You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I think God wants us if if to be happy. Yeah. Yeah. You believe in God, don't you think that your God wants you to be happy? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, supposed to be joyful, guys. Life. If you're is, miserable, change your situation. Change it. Okay, so according to Sharon, the wife, around 5.30 p.m. on the evening of March 19th, she heard a gunshot from the direction of the bedroom in which her husband was sleeping. She went in the room, found her two-and-a-half-year-old Dana on the bed next to the father. She was holding one of James's guns. Oh, no. Uh, she was, frames her child. Mm -hmm. She said he was bleeding from an apparent gunshot wound in the back of his head. She called the police, but James was dead by the time the ambulance arrived. <laughs> this is horrible. You frame your child. Frame the the rest of your life, that child, yeah. that's what she has to uh -huh. think happened? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was her plan? Yep. So police were unable to recover any fingerprints because the gun was so well oiled on the grip um, and the paraffin test for the gunshot residue was not performed or Dana on Dana or Sharon. Uh, and multiple people, including family and neighbors, told police that James had often allowed Dana to play with his guns. And in a test by investigating officers, Dana proved able to pull a trigger on a gun matching the one that had killed her father. Um, so they just ruled the case accidental homicide and um they took keep in mind they took this pistol into custody so they kept this pistol okay because it gets worse so with the investigation into his death closed because it was an accidental homicide uh he was buried the life insurance policy was collected it was twenty nine thousand dollars which would amount to two hundred thirty thousand dollars today okay so let's hop over to the next person, little puzzle piece in this puzzle. 
Okay. Uh-huh. I'm just... Okay. I'm just irritated. <laughs> irritated with this one. What kind of mother frames her uh -huh. time? Yep, yep, yep. So Patricia Jones was born Patricia Clements, one of six children uh, to Mr. and Mrs. Clements in Joseph, St. Joseph, Missouri. Uh, she graduated from a local high school and she married Walter T. Jones Jr. It was her high school sweetheart. Uh, Walter enlisted in the Marine Corps shortly after their marriage and they relocated to the West Coast. Um, after his discharge, they returned uh, to the Midwest and settled in Independence. So that is where mm -hmm. they were. And um, they were there with their two children. By the 60s, almost five years into their marriage, Patricia was working as a file clerk for the Internal Revenue Service while her husband sold cars. Um, Walter reportedly had a wandering eye. On April 18th, he met Sharon Kinney when she bought a Ford Thunderbird from his dealership using some of the insurance payout from her husband's death. So they just started chit-chatting. Oh no. After she spent all this money on a car. Um, yeah, she kind of saw him as like another prospect for her husband because he's making all this money selling cars. Well, honey, he wasn't going to until you used your deceased husband's money. Yeah, and uh Yep. Um, so they they started chatting, and um, he declined to go on a trip to Washington with her in May. She went with her brother, and then they decided to start chatting again when she got back. Um, the relationship was on the rocks, on, on and off the rocks. And uh, she told him that she was pregnant with one of his babies. Oh no! So instead of mm -hmm, instead of him being like, "Oh my gosh, let me leave, we leave my wife. Like this is horrible. I'll take care of you," uh, he just ended the affair and was like, "Get out of here! You're crazy. Yeah, I'm I'm not having anything to do with this." So, <laughs> according to later testimony, on the afternoon of May 26, she contacted Patricia, his wife, at um the his office or her office and told her that Walter was having an affair with Kenny's sister. Yeah. Who's Kenny? Well that's the last name. Oh. Uh her deceased husband's sister. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. I was like what? I'm yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. the whole person. Gotcha. So then she met with Patricia that evening to discuss the matter further and said she dropped her off near the Joneses house. Patricia, Patricia Jones was never, she never made it to her house that evening, according to her husband. Uh, he filed a missing persons report with police the next day. And some people called in saying they may have seen her. He got a lead when he spoke to friends of Patricia's who carpooled to work with her. Uh, the friend said that she had received a phone call that day from an unnamed woman who wanted to meet with her. Uh, she had asked the carpool driver to drop her off at the street corner in Independence, and they did. And they saw a woman waiting for her in another car at the shop, but didn't recognize her. They um, just gave a description. Can you imagine being, uh, what's his name, the Walter, mm -hmm. and being like, you've just ended this relationship with this woman who you've decided is crazy. Yeah. And then your wife disappears. Yes. And you have to, like, some deep oh, down yeah. part of you has to yeah. know. Yeah. Well, he kind of did. This he, really yeah. makes me wonder about um, her upbringing. I just really yes. want to know, like, what well, were her parents, parents like? moving her around? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know. Why did she yes. do this? Why did she oh, need yeah. to? Yeah. Um, so, he did get a little suspicious and he called her. He called Sharon and said, have you seen or spoken to my wife? <laughs> oh. And she said she had seen Patricia that day. She had met her to tell her about Walter's affair. And according to her, she last saw Patricia where she dropped her off near the Jones house. Um, and she said that she saw her speaking to an unknown man in a green 1957 Ford. Um, and that was kind of like her admission over the phone. So he met with her late Friday evening and insisted she gave him more details about where his wife was, what happened. And um, she did admit that she was holding a key to her throat, threatening her. And uh, yeah, yeah. What? And so then he was like, please just help, like, please cooperate and help us find my wife. Like, this is ridiculous. This is going way too far. Like, please just help Stop. us. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and so shortly before midnight and within hours of her conversation with Walter, she and that one guy who she had offered money to in the first place that she was seeing with the bold, bold yeah. uh, they are the ones that found the body of a woman in a secluded area approximately one mile outside of Independence. Oh. Yeah, he apparently he had been the one to suggest searching in the area in which they encountered the body. Yeah, and it was a spot that he and her had Sharon had gone to many a times to like talk talk pray mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes exactly yeah have bible study together uh -huh. exactly worship her body um so the body uh was in a black sweater and a yellow skirt and it was identified as the miss missing patricia oh, poor woman uh, yeah she had been hit with four shots from a 22 caliber pistol although the fatal wound was shot to her head um it was near her mouth and an upward trajectory. God. She had a bullet wound to her abdomen and two penetrating gunshot wounds to her shoulders on a downward trajectory. So it's like, I, I would imagine like the girl like holding the gun up to like here and then like her falling and like shooting her a couple more times. That's my assumption. Do you, um, think, do you think that Sharon had any friends? I mean, no, it doesn't seem as though she or did. Or female friends especially. But it doesn't, yeah. It doesn't seem as though she, she dates did. women. Mm-hmm. And herself. Yeah. So, I mean, they immediately began to question her. Yeah, clearly. Clearly. Uh -huh. And James, the bulldozers, and Walter. And all three were questioned on May 28th. James um, and Walter both agreed to give written statements, and they both agreed to do lie detector tests. She gave an oral statement but refused a lie detector test and refused to sign a written statement. Uh, she was a she was questioned again in that morning, um, and the two guys polygraph tests came back, and it seemed as though they were being truthful about the whole situation. Would you take a lie detector test? No, I don't think I would either. Because I am a very anxious person, even when I'm like being asked normal questions, uh, like even like taking a test at school. Yeah. So I'm just I don't like it. It seems like well, and also they ask you like the weirdest questions to like see how it spikes your heart rate right. and stuff. But like, if you pass it, so what? Yeah, but if you fail, if you it, fail it, you're because screwed. you're a nervous wreck, then right. you're screwed. So it just seems Even like you are being truthful. But also, if you I don't even know to take they one. can't even really use those in court anymore, can they? I don't think so. But it's more of the court of public opinion, mm -hmm. like. If, they're, if they get say, oh, she refused a polygraph test, right. then, oh, well, she must be hiding something. Exactly. And it's like, no, if you know anything about true crime, <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 you know, don't ever take yes. a polygraph test. Yeah. Um, they questioned potential suspects and witnesses, and um, it, they just, they couldn't find anything. So attempts were made to find the last bullet that had passed through her body. And the murder weapon, including, you know, sifting through the dirt at the crime scene. And um, when Boy Scouts were out, they found a 22 caliber rifle slug uh, oh, buried no. in the ground where her body had been found. So they um, buried the gun right by where her body was. Found. It was a rifle slug. So, oh, oh, oh. so the, yeah, got the, it. Like, I got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they drug the bottom of nearby bodies of water to look for the gun and it, they just couldn't find it. Um, they also searched buildings near where her body had been located and they searched for blood and gunshot evidence. And, um, it, they were just like, she had to have been attacked somewhere else and transported because we cannot find some, anything. Uh, but a white powdery substance was found in her hair, which was initially believed to tra be trace evidence of some other crime scene area. Mm -hmm. um, so then they just like started searching all sorts of buildings and it, just all sorts of things. But it was fly eggs. Oh, so it had nothing to do with where she was killed. Yeah. It's just. Yeah. Great. So she was arrested um, at her home for the murder around 11 p.m. on May 31st the same night of the funeral. Um, the same day, the Jackson County Sheriff requested the prosecutors consider a second charge of murder, this one for the death of her husband. And her attorney um, filed a writ of habeas corpus with the court the next morning. 
and a hearing that afternoon resulted in the release on a $20,000 bond while she awaited her pre preliminary hearing. So, like I said, her 22 was still in the custody of As law enforcement. Officers. So they were like, well, may, it could, it, possibly it's not her. Like, oh. what? she didn't have a gun. How was it her? Do they not, are, is there like one 22 in like the whole world? Exactly. So it could yeah. be her. Yeah, it couldn't, it couldn't have been her at all because she was the only one that owned it and now it's in the possession of the sheriff's department. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so um, there was a guy who she had worked with and he admitted that he secretly purchased a new 22 caliber pistol at her request in the beginning of May. Uh, police were unable to locate that gun in question when they searched her house, uh, but they did find an empty box that they believe once held that gun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so maybe they just made a duplicate like those 3D printers or something. Just came in handy at that time. <laughs> in 1956. Yes, yeah. Uh, Walter Jones, um, the deceased, decedent's husband, was taken into custody on June 2nd as a material witness to the case and was freed the same day on a $2,000 bond. So she got a twenty thousand dollar bond. He got a two thousand dollar bond. I don't understand. They Why took him into custody yeah. for as a witness. Were yeah. they just afraid he would run? Maybe, maybe? probably. And didn't want to be a part of it. Maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. I wouldn't want to be a part of it either. No. And um, they were saying that they should have done more, like the embalmer and stuff should have done more, like or the not embalmer, the coroner should have done more, um, like investigative discovery search they're saying that they didn't test for gunshot residue on her body and all of this stuff and didn't like really look for more gunshot evidence it was just a mess um they were also like sh they should have searched her stomach contents to see what was happening like that i guess you get a better idea of a timeline yeah i guess but still what does that matter um her Arraignment on July 11th resulted in denial of bail, but the Kansas City Court of Appeals struck that down um, based on the prosecu prosecution's reliance on circumstantial evidence. She was freed on $24,000 bond, which is now worth $188,976 as of 2013. Um, so even more now. After a delay in her trial due date, because she was very pregnant in jail, she gave birth to a daughter and named her. Was it Walter's baby? She says it is. Because remember, that's what sparked all of this. And he was like, nope, get out of I just assumed that was a lie. Nope, she was pregnant. Yep. Oh, so they charged her with both the murders of Patricia and James. And she was tried separately for the two crimes because they were separate times, separate instances. So her trial for the murder of Patricia Jones began mid-June, um, with the jury selection beginning on about June 13th, and it was an all-male jury. So opening arguments That's by- not a jury of your peers. I know. Opening arguments by both prosecution and defense set up cases based on um, times of death. The detective recalled statements by her that she was afraid of Jones, or she was afraid that Jones was drifting away from her despite her finan despite the financial support she offered him. And Jones testified that uh, Kenny had told him she was pregnant by him and he had therefore attempted to end the relationship. Hmm. So uh, they couldn't establish that she owned or had owned um, the weapon that killed her, killed Jones. Um, but she did have that weapon at one time. Um, the guy who sold the pistol to the co-worker had led police to a tree that contained what he claimed to be bullets he had fired from that pistol. Um, but the bullets were extracted from the tree trunk and tests showed that the extracted bullets weren't similar and they weren't from the same weapon. So who knows at this point? Right. Um, their case... It's very weird, and it just gets even weirder. The prosecution rested on June 21st after calling 27 witnesses. Um, her defense took less than two days and involved 14, 14 with witnesses. Other than her, she didn't testify. Um, they focused on breaking down the state's claim of motive and means. Um, over one and a half hours of deliberation, the jury cited just too many loopholes left in the prosecution's case, and they found her not guilty. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So um, one of the jurors had asked her for her autograph right after she was found not guilty. Was she really pretty? Was she? I mean, I don't understand. She was a... I just don't understand. Yeah. How she is able to do all the things that she does. Yeah. And you know, people give way too much credit to attractiveness. So I'm just curious. Like, yeah. Is she really I, attractive? I mean, like what in the world? Kind of. Or but charismatic not. or Yeah, I don't know. But keep in mind she still had even though she's not guilty for that, she's still waiting trial for her husband's death. I would think of the two of them. Yeah. Patricia's is the one that's the most obviously her. Yeah. Because I feel like in the husband's one, it would be easy to be like, no mother would frame her child. And, you know, it, yeah. it is possible that the child did it. Yeah. I can't believe that that's the one they found her not guilty of. Yeah. So, um, even though she was acquitted in that case, uh, she remained under charges of the murder for her husband. And when jury was selected, uh, it began on uh, January 8th. The district attorney noted that he did not intend to pursue the death penalty in the case. So the case rested largely on their um, contention that she had been so interested in seeing her husband killed or seeing her husband removed from the situation that she was willing to pay for him to be murdered. Um, and they, they were just like, well, she's got this $29,000 life insurance policy. Of course she would have had him killed like a thousand dollars and a thousand dollars for a divorce and paying for the house. She wants $29,000. Yeah. Like, she wants to live lavishly. Mm -hmm. And she wants him gone. So, that was that was their defense. Like, look, like, this is what we see is happening. We see that this is what's going on. So, the trial ended in conviction on January 11th after five and a half hours of deliberation. On April of the same year, she was formally sentenced to life in prison. Okay. She began to serve her sentence in the Missouri Reformatory for women. So, she had how many kids? Two daughters and a son? Yeah. My poor kids. I know. So, despite the verdict, James's family, her in-laws, continued to believe the best about her. And they would tell reporters, and they told reporters on the day of the verdict, we can't find it in our hearts to say anything bad about her. We still don't feel that she committed the murder. Um, and she also told reporters that she felt the verdict was a mistake, and she regretted her previous enthusiasm for having a woman on the jury. <laughs> She'd been implicated in two murders. Yep. Yeah. So the following week after that, her lawyers requested that she be released on bond. And it was supported by a community petition signed by 132 supporters of her innocence. Uh, it was denied on the basis of first degree murder and not being a bailable offense. And um, her lawyers felt their involvement in such petition at a time when a motion for bond was being considered was highly improper. Am I just really jaded? Like, what's wrong? No, I don't see this any is, uh, yeah, I don't... possibility of her being innocent here. Yeah. And they said that there were, like, lots of errors in this and that, um, including, like, a juror was taking incomplete notes and stuff. And I'm like, how... If I was a juror, I wouldn't be able to keep notes. I'm not the one, like, typing everything. No. Well, I just don't under... I just don't understand. No. Why are people so... I mean, Except why did they love her so, so much? So a second request for a rehearing on the validity of her conviction was denied by the Missouri Supreme Court. And she and her children moved in with her mother and awaited the start of a new trial. So she was out on bond, but she couldn't. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it was a $25,000 bond Great. of July of that year that she was released on. Okay. So... Um, the jury, again, was all men, and they were immediately sequestered, but days later, a mistrial was declared after it emerged that the law partner of Prosecutor Lawrence Gepford had once been retained by one of the jurors. So nothing that she had done, nothing that they had proved, it was something stupid that had to do with one of the jurors. So the petition the community did, is, is that's how they got her to the second? Yeah, 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 yeah. A whole new trial again? Yeah. And now there's this. Yep. So her third trial for the murder of her husband was originally scheduled to begin early June 64. But instead, on June 29th, um, Assistant Prosecutor Donald Mason declared at jury selection that he intended the death 
um, quality qualify to death qualify the jury. Mm -hmm. So he was just like, I'm over this. Mm -hmm. She could get the death penalty at this point. Like this is ridiculous. I'm just, it's just too much. So how many times can we yeah, try this case? Like what are we doing? So the jury selection once again took more than twelve hours, and um, John Boldles's <laughs> his testimony in the trial remained contradictory as to whether or not um, they believed that his or her offer to him was serious, um, because he was like, well, I mean, she she could have been kidding. Who jokes about that? Yeah, yeah. And then they brought in a new witness, a female acquaintance of hers, and she testified that she had once joked to her that she should get rid of the woman's old man like she did. Um, but the defense cross-examined and was just like, well, I mean, there's nothing to this. It was just like, goodbye. Or say or like whatever. Here. Yeah. So for the first time at any of her trials, she took the stand on the last day of the trial to issue a denial of all the charges. Mm-hmm. The all-male jury deadlocked seven to five in favor of acquittal of this trial, resulting in a second mistrial. <laughs> Megan has her hand, her head in her hands, and just just that it was seven to five for acquittal. Yeah. Oh yeah. So listen. I just feel like I'm missing something. Listen, there's a fourth trial happening, and the death of her husband, and it was scheduled for October of '64, but in September. She was still free on her $25,000 bond, traveled to Mexico with an alleged lover, Francis, leaving her children with James's father. She traveled with Francis as his wife under the name Jeanette, and they later said that they had come to Mexico to get married. Um, and But under, under the legal terms of her bail, she was permitted to leave the country, but... She had a contract with the company that gave her bond or posted her bond, and they said she couldn't leave Missouri without a written per permission from their agents. So she crossed the border and registered at a local hotel called Hotel Gin, and they registered as husband and wife. She said that she felt unsafe in the foreign country, so they decided to buy a pistol. So now they had multiple guns and um, because they had brought a couple with them from the U.S. as well. Naturally. Yes. So September 1964, she left the hotel without Francis. Um, either she wanted to go get money or they were running low on something or she needed to go get medicine that she had to take. And she met a Francisco, a Mexican-born American citizen at a bar that night. And she went back to his hotel room with him. Yep. So according to her, uh, she went without Francis to see photographs this guy had offered to show her. But he soon began like making, se she claims he was making sexual advances towards her. So she was forced to fire a gun at him to protect herself. <laughs> she yes. killed somebody else. Killed somebody else. After everything she's gone through. After she fled to Mexico. Uh -huh. She said she was only trying to scare him, but her bullets struck him in the chest and killed him. I'm sorry, I'm aiming a gun away from you, but I struck you in the chest. Bad aim, I'm sorry, my bad. I just can't believe. I guess at this point she thinks, well, I keep getting away with it. Yeah. They tried me three, listen, four times. Listen, it gets worse. So one of the hotel staff ran to towards the gunfire to see what was going on, and she fired again and hit him in the shoulder. So he fled, and he locked her inside the hotel room. Yeah. And called the police. She's the worst. Yeah. So the police were like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> Can you what? please just you stop killing people? You again. Yeah, we know her. We know. We, God, come on. Come on. We, let's go. <laughs> we know your story. So they were just like, screw this. Uh, they theorized that she had gone out that evening intending to rob this guy. And then she, um, when he was like, no, I'm not doing anything. She just shot him. <laughs> I, so she's now arrested again on charges of homicide and assault with a deadly weapon and she claims she didn't mean to harm him I don't and they also took Francis into custody as well and they hold, held him without charge and later filed charges of entering the county or country illegally and carrying an unlicensed gun 
She thinks she's smarter than everybody else. I know. I mean, she's a mess. She just thinks whatever story I give, they'll believe. But listen, one of the guns they found in her room was the one that killed Patricia in 1960. Oh! But because but she she'd already been found, she was acquitted, so they couldn't bring in new evidence. Can they bring that evidence into the other trial? I, I don't know. Are they allowed to mention it? I guess it all depends on like what the judge allows in there. Yeah, I don't know. In her husband's trial or whatever. Because they hadn't gotten to that yet because she fled the freaking country. Well, they got to it. They got to it three other times. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So Francis, the guy she was with, was held at Policio de la Com something, something, something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. While she was initially placed at a women's prison um, before she was transferred. So they were arraigned on September 26th and held for trial. And Wait, are she now for trial? On trial for the murder mm -hmm. she did in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Okay. She's still waiting for the fourth trial yes, about James, because right? she's got to be extradited back to there. Yeah. So Real I guess smart to get arrested in a foreign country. Real yes. smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was cleared of charges against him and was deported back to the she's U.S. Mm -hmm. But she was convicted on October 18th of homicide of that guy. Um, Francisco, Francisco or whatever his name was. Wait, I don't um, understand. I thought... Did you just say she was clear? He was clear. He was Francis, clear. Francis was okay. clear. No, no, no. Francis yeah. was clear. Well, clear, I mean, he was in the room. He was just like, I thought I loved her. I thought she loved me. She didn't kill me. She loved me. Oh, honey, your standards are Baby. too low. Well, yeah. yeah. I'm still alive. This must be real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she was sentenced to a 10-year prison term for those crimes that she committed while there in Mexico. Um, and she was notified of the sentence the next day. She said she was going to appeal that conviction and she was returned to the women's prison to serve her sentence. And then while there, she was nicknamed La Pistolera, the gunfighter, a nickname um, that was adopted by the Mexican press. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so instead of her appeal being um, overruled, like overturned or whatever, they lengthened it. So the three-man superior court uh, heard her case and overturned one aspect of her conviction, charges of attempted robbery, but they upheld the murder conviction and increased her sentence from 10 to 13. They said it was her initial was too lenient. We're going to tack on three more years That's here. Amazing. So in December, God, she's just like all over the place. She wasn't present for routine roll call at the jail at 5 p.m. If she escaped. <laughs> I swear to God. <laughs> <laughs> so they didn't think anything of it. They were like, Meh, maybe she's just sitting in her cell. It's fine. But then she was absent for a second roll call. Sorry. Wait. Wait. Yep. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. first time you notice a prisoner is missing. They're like, man, just go, just go double check. I'm going to see. It's orange just the don't new black. They're probably assume, just doing it somewhere. Don't just assume you know where. Oh. She's not here, but she's probably, it's probably fine. Don't even go look. It, you know, I'm Don't not, even worry about it. Well, Pistolera, she's good. So, so, she was not there for a second roll call, and the news of her disappearance was not reported to Mexico City Police until 2 a.m. the following morning. So <laughs> let's, they, just, let's just not tell anyone. Hey, do you think they'll notice if she's gone? Everybody be cool. <laughs> Don't say a word. Stuff some pillows in her bed. We are happy Blankets without over her it. here. Yeah. We don't want her back. It's a lot more peaceful. She just keeps running her dang mouth about things. <laughs> They're never going to extradite her. <laughs> Get her out of here. Okay, so they um, coordinated a manhunt and focused on the northern Mexican states due to authorities' belief that she may have been headed for the last known whereabouts of a former inmate who she had grown close to when they were in prison together. Um, but they did encompass like a countrywide transport and they circled back to the Mexican city area or Mexico city area. And um, American authorities, including the FBI, were also alerted of this and they thought she may be attempting to work her way back into the U.S. Yeah. Because um, she's stupid. Yeah. But the FBI was like, we don't we don't have jurisdiction on this. Because I don't I, I don't. No. It should have been the Mexican authorities, I guess, at the time of her location or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So they speculated that she had bribed the guards to look the other way when she escaped, but an unusual blackout had been reported at the prison that evening, and it was during the time of her escape. So I don't know how she caused this blackout. I mean, if she has the same powers I do, like I shut off yeah. electric everywhere. Um, lights, power, whatever. I don't know. Who knows? Um, but um, the door should have been locked, but it had been left open. So maybe the guards did. It's another example of her being some somehow she just keeps. Yeah, yeah, people yeah. just want to help her for some reason. Yeah, Why? I don't know. she's literally in prison for murder. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And they also said that her mother may have been involved in this escape plan. A former Mexican Secret Service agent had assisted, or that a former <laughs> Secret Service agent had assisted in her escape, and that um, she may have disguised herself as a man to escape. So another theory speculates that her, the family of Francisco, the guy that she had murdered, had helped her escape and then killed her. Oh, to get her own revenge. Uh huh. And this manhunt was really short lived. The Mexican Secret Service and the Mexico City District Attorney, they were both just reporting that they're just no longer looking for him. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The like federal done. District Attorney was reporting that they, the responsibility then became the city district attorney's office and they were all just like passing it around. Um, and they all claimed she may have already crossed the border to, into Guatemala. Um, and so they were just like, we, I mean, she was fluent in Spanish. So, I mean, she could be getting along fine. She could be blending in. Um, I'm sorry. Are you about to tell me that they didn't ever find her? More than 40 years after her escape, she still remains at home. Are you kidding me? Oh, I dislike her so <laughs> much. Yeah. Yeah. She's still, I mean, had they, if her, you know, the last guy she murdered, if they didn't find her, she's still running around. Nope. I'm going to believe that they found her and got they her. They got her out of jail so they could kill her. And that would be amazing if they did. She murdered four? No. She Three still, people. She didn't even go to trial. No. Well, she for did. Her, for her husband, though. Well, she went to trial for yeah, years, three But not for the final she trial, which yeah. probably yeah. also would have not. Given her, well, because it would have given her the death penalty. <sighs> oh, man. Sneaky little shit. People who disappear i'm yeah. telling you what whether it's like because something bad happened to them or like this yeah. because they run away it fascinates me yeah how do you disappear running at large for 40 years 40 plus years if I you're wonder if that's why mexico stopped looking for her though because they know she's dead maybe because why would you stop just keep her on the list like do they know that this guy is like part of the cartel mm -hmm. and that they can't say anything about it but they're like oh we know She's dead. Like, we purposely shut off the lights so they could get in and get her. Drag her out. I would like to think that that happened. I bet that's what happened. We're going to go Good ahead. Lord. That's crazy. Isn't it? <sighs> and Megan what a was, ride. And Megan like, was, so many things happened in that story. <laughs> yeah. Not <laughs> just one death. Not just one pregnancy. Not just one trial. No. <laughs> And where are her kids? Also, did we ever really find out if it was Walter's baby or not? I mean, it didn't ever say that DNA tests were done. I don't know. Oh, man. man. All right, well. As much as it irritated me, it was a really good story. It was, <laughs> wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. You're welcome for sharing that nugget. <laughs> <laughs> Just one of those things to lie awake about. Lie well, awake and think about it at night. Yeah. Where are these people? This is why I want to become a PI. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I would have so much fun as a PI. Oh my gosh. I bet you get stuck doing some boring things. You do. Know, just sit on cars and like things. random parking lots. And like, I feel like it would be a lot of like workers comp things. Yeah. Yeah. Is this person limping into Kroger right now? No? Okay. <laughs> That's true. Then that wouldn't be fun. Mm-mm. -mm. All right. Well, yeah. Thanks for listening, guys. Yeah, guys. Tune in. Um, what's the usual thing? Which is Magic Murder Mystery at gmail.com. Yeah, or hit us up on Instagram. Oh, don't forget to, if you are on Facebook, go join our group, which is Magic Murder Mystery 
podcast discussion group. That is correct. Oh my gosh, I did it on my own. <laughs> <laughs> answer the questions, we'll let you in. Yeah, please answer those dang <laughs> questions. We finally got it cleared out, and now there's just one floater in there. No, no. I just don't know. Don't know why. All right. All right, guys. Goodbye. Goodbye.